Thanks for the introduction. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Kirk Rogers. I'm the instructor of criminal justice here at Northwest Oklahoma State University. This presentation tonight is brought to you uh, and sponsored by the American Association for University Women. It was put together by Dr. Lindstrom, Karen Lindstrom, and uh, Dr. Cynthia Pfeiffer Hill. So, big round of applause for them. Uh, they put them all <laughs> I have the distinct pleasure tonight to introduce you to uh, Agent Mike Stone. And all right, you can just call him Mike. And I'm being formal, but you can call him Mike. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Mike for many, many years. Uh, he certainly doesn't look like it, but believe it or not, Mike has been in law enforcement for almost 30 years now. I didn't give that up. Um, he actually started his career with the Winona Police Department and then became a deputy sheriff for the Woods County Sheriff's Office. Eventually rose to the rank of under sheriff. Um, there's three of us. Yeah, there's so that figure deal. <laughs> Trying to get him some accolades here. Yeah. He's okay. just killing me. Killing me. I'm sorry. In 1996, Mike was hired with the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics. And for 10 years, he served as a field agent uh, for the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics before moving into a supervisory position. Um, as their uh, agent in charge of training. After doing that for a couple of years, Mike went on to the wiretap and intelligence unit and did that for a period of years before uh, becoming the agent in charge of the human tra uh, trafficking division for the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics. This is a new division within the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics that was created by an act of the state legislature last November. Um, and thus far, Mike has been the uh, first supervisor in that particular position. So uh, he's very knowledgeable. Uh, Mike has, um, as far as narcotics work and police work goes, Mike has probably forgot more about law enforcement than uh, I can teach him. So uh, he's very, very knowledgeable on this topic. And this is certainly a topic that um, is kind of front and center stage right now in uh, criminal justice. And you're, you're hearing a lot of talk about human trafficking. You're going to hear a lot of talk tonight about things like prostitution. You're going to hear talk, uh, people talking about pimps. Um, it's at times possibly going to get uh, a little bit graphic, maybe. You're going to hear some um, terms that may make a few people uncomfortable. Uh, we apologize for that in advance, but I think we're all adults. Um, but I'd also like to announce that on this particular topic, uh, starting in the summer of 2014, uh, Northwestern Oklahoma State is uh, actually going to be offering a course in human trafficking. Uh, it's going to be taught by Ruth Walter Smith. And for those of you that are in Ruth's class uh, or any of her classes, you've probably never seen her. She's hardly on campus, but I'm very happy to, to say that Ruth Walter Smith is in the audience tonight. She's back there. <laughs> Uh, Ruth has spent really a, about a year and a half researching this topic pretty extensively and, and uh, participating in different organizations dealing with human trafficking um, so she could uh, develop this, this course. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we're going to be offering uh, this type of a specialized course in law enforcement uh, starting in summer 2014. And uh, she's certainly become a resident of human trafficking expert. All right, we'll go ahead and start. Thank you guys. Thank you, Kurt. I'm impressed. Kurt Rogers did that without notes. I didn't even know. I didn't even, no, he did. And I didn't even know some of that stuff about myself. I, <laughs> Kurt says I forgot more about law enforcement. I, I caught that. I, I heard that. That's what my kids say all the time. Because I will say this. For those of you from Alabama who may remember me, at my age, everybody looks vaguely familiar. <laughs> everybody. Right? Everybody. So, so if I don't speak to you, please come and speak to me because a lot of times I may know you. In fact, I chased a lady down the hall in the high school earlier today and insisted that I knew her. And she said, but I've only been here a couple years. I said, oh, sorry. I really did. So at my age, everybody looks vaguely familiar. Okay, so you enough about me. You've heard all about me. Uh, the only other thing I want to say about me is uh, I spent a bunch of time, uh, way too much time, uh, with a minivan and hair down to my rear end and a pocket full of tax money. 
And my job was to go around the state and buy drugs. So and I loved every minute. I had a blast. But I picked up some kind of bad habits that my wife has counseled me on. And in and, and 30 years of marriage, she's counseled me. And, and the pastor has counseled me. So if I get to talking really fast and say something that would get kicked get me kicked out of Sunday school? Can we can we forgive me in advance? Yes. I probably won't. But, but guys, uh, I'm going to try real hard not to. But guys, uh, we are going to talk about sex. I had I had a high school girl ask me today, we're not going to talk about sex, are we? And I was like, uh, no. We're talking about internet safety. Right? Uh, and that's what we're talking about. Because, guys, here's part of the problem. You all need to know what human trafficking is. Most importantly, you need to know what human trafficking is not. Because about half of my day is spent literally fighting the internet war and the media war on what is and what isn't human trafficking. Uh, I, I have developed a love-hate relationship with the media. No offense, Valerie. Uh, Valerie's not one of them. I'm talking about those those perfectly groomed people that are on the behind the desk and they put cue cards in front of them and they read everything you know in front of them and they have no idea what they're talking about right and and unfortunately Ruth can testify human trafficking is the hot button flavor of the minute right so we're overwhelmed with calls uh, from the media about human trafficking and we spend a lot of our time explaining to them what it is not, okay? Even some of my brothers and sisters in law enforcement don't quite get it. So that's what we're gonna spend our time talking about today, tonight. Uh, I have no ego invested in this PowerPoint, so we get like to slide three, and you wanna say, hey, that's enough, let's just talk. Uh, ask me questions and we'll, we'll answer. If I don't know, I have been undercover now, I can make some crap up. <laughs> We'll just, uh, we'll just carry on, okay? So that's my phone number. Now, that, and what y'all don't really know is that's not really my name or my phone number. But that's my number. That's how you get a hold of me. Uh, if at any time, Ruth or any of you in education, any of you writing a paper, any of you doing any of that kind of stuff, if I can help you, that's what I want to do, okay? I've got seven hard-charging name taken, note writing investigator that worked for me. Uh, we covered the state from Miami to uh, Altus and from Boise City to Idaho. Uh, we have no boundaries, right? And we will get after it. If you have a problem, you call me. If I can't help you, somebody I know will, okay? So having said all that, is that human trafficking? That's a picture, for those of you that are, are impaired a little like me, of a young woman in the dashboard of a car. How, how, now, how do you involuntarily get someone in the dashboard of a car? Is that human smuggling? There you go. Is there a difference between human trafficking and human smuggling? Yes. Yeah. When somebody brings something to me and says, I need to know if this is human trafficking, my number one answer always is, maybe. It's a crime that has to be investigated. It has elements to it, right? It's not just something I can look at a picture and go, oh, human trafficking. And, I, and I, I'm going to pick a little bit on my agency, just a tiny little bit. We're, we're just as bad as everybody. We've always got these pictures on the billboards and the pictures on the internet. If you want to make your kids mad, call it the internet. So that makes them mad. <laughs> or the Google machine. <laughs> we, we've got these pictures of somebody with their hands tied or chained to a wall. How in the world are you going to make money with somebody whose hands are tied and they're chained to a wall? This is about money. This is about profit. This is the drug traffickers who have simply changed commodity. That's it. That's it. So we do ourselves a huge disservice when we do this whole, somebody's tied up, right, in a basement. Right? Well, Mr. Castro up in uh, Ohio or wherever, 
Was that human trafficking? It's kidnapping and rape. He was not profiting commercially from those girls being there. Right? So, typically my answer to this one is, because I know the background on this case, that is not human trafficking. That is smuggling. What about that? <coughs> human trafficking or human smuggling? Uh, we have the interdiction units out on Interstate 40. And not very long ago, uh, they got a, a uh, 12 or 14 Hispanic illegals in a van, and they called Homeland Security uh, and asked uh, for those guys to get detained. And Homeland Security, the operator on the phone, a very well-intentioned person, uh, told them to call the OBN Human Trafficking Unit. Guys, that's not human trafficking. It's human smuggling. There's a huge difference. They entered into a consensual agreement with a criminal to get them from point A to point B, right? And once that destination has been reached, that agreement is over, they're free to go about their business. Now, at that point, are they potential victims of human traffickers? If they don't have a plan, where am I going to work? Where am I going to live? What am I going to do? They're at the mercy of certain criminal elements, right? Because they're here illegally, they've already got a problem. Does that happen in, oh, I don't know, Woods County? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, and I'm not picking on anybody in particular, but I can remember as a deputy here, at certain times of the year when the cattle went to the feedlot, there were whole families out on the highway. Suddenly jobless, right? So it happens all over the state. What I want you to understand is human smuggling is pretty much a lot of times referred to uh, as human trafficking and is not. The other thing that I fight with the media about a lot is not every runaway is a human trafficking victim. If you've got a young person missing from a community, doesn't necessarily mean they're human trafficking victims. It's very uncommon for someone to physically take custody of someone else and then sell them. But we hear that more and more. Uh, we hear that pretty regularly from, uh, how do I say it, disgruntled wives, right? The psychology in human trafficking and the psychology in in uh, domestic violence is a lot the same thing, right? So uh, um, a young lady gets tired of her husband smacking on her. She calls the police and says, he's threatened to sell me to human traffickers. That happens in rural Oklahoma quite a little bit. Does the guy know any human traffickers? <coughs> I mean, and if you interview him, he's like, well, I couldn't get anything for her anyway. <laughs> I'm just joking. Come on, guys. This is a serious subject. But, but guys, if we don't learn to laugh at ourselves just a little tiny bit, we'll all go nuts, right? So there are different issues. <coughs> Human smuggling is the movement of a person across the international border. We've already talked about that. But here's the B. Here's what I want you to see. This is the definition that the International Association of Human Trafficking Investigators uh, came up with. And we have certain elements that are so important that we actually wrote them into the state statute, right? In November of 2012, the legislators passed statutory authority for the Bureau of Narcotics to have uh, uh, original jurisdiction in human trafficking. We can't investigate anything unless the statute says we can. The OSBI can't investigate anything unless the statute says they can. The Highway Patrol enforces traffic laws because the, tr the statute says that they will. So we changed Title 63 and then we added to Title 21 a definition and elements of human trafficking. First of all, exploitation. That's fairly self-explanatory. Somebody's going to have to be victimized. Okay? Exploitation. And here's the big ones. 
force, fraud, and coercion. I want to say that about 18 times tonight so you get it. Force, fraud, or coercion. Some people, and I'm going to say this and it makes somebody mad, I'm sorry. Listen very carefully. All prostitutes are victims. But not all prostitutes are victims of human trafficking. Some prostitutes are victims of themselves. They make really bad decisions. Some prostitutes are victims of violence. They're victims of the economy. They're victims of lack of education, lack of opportunity. They're in a bad place. But they are not victims of human trafficking. That's our job in a nutshell, is to take those people who are being exploited and find a trafficker at the back end of that exploitation. Does that make sense to everybody? Force, fraud, or coercion. We all understand force. We all do. What's your name? Jet. Jet? I got it the first time. Look at that. My new hearing aids are working. <laughs> if I told Jet to do so, go wash my car, and he said, I don't really feel like it, I backhand him across the head. Is that force? Yeah, it, it's not near the force that you're going to see when Jet gets up and kicks the crap out of me. <laughs> He's a pretty good sized guy. But we all understand force, right? We all understand force and the threat of force. What's fraud? Anybody, there are no wrong answers, guys. Come on. Lying. What's fraud? What? Lying. No, that's wrong. <laughs> I'd love to do that. How many teachers we got in here? Do that at least once in class. There are no wrong answers. And then the first person says, no, that's wrong. <laughs> it's lying. It's cheating, right? Uh, if you give me $10,000, I'll put a new roof on your house. And I need the money up front because i got to buy material. <coughs> and, and four months later, you have no roof on your house, and you're looking for me. Is that fraud? Did I commit a fraud? Uh -huh. Could I commit fraud? Could I promise a young person that if they go to sell magazines for me, they're going to make a lot of money, right? They're going to see the world, and everything's going to be great. And three months later, uh, they're in trouble, right? Is that a fraud? <laughs> Lastly is coercion. And this is probably the hardest one to prove and the most crucial element of human trafficking. Uh, um, let me see. This whole row, you're young, everybody here's young. Stand up for me. See some hesitation? You march to the beat of a different drummer. Okay, sit back down. And I didn't have to do anything silly. Why did you stand up? No, no, think about it. What? I asked you to. Right? Do what? Am I like your boss? Am I the boss? Like my kids used to say, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> uh, do I sign your paycheck? Am I a teacher? No. Do I have any authority over you at all? No. The only authority I have over you is perceived. I'm standing up, you're sitting down. I hold the clicker, I'm wearing a coat, much to my dismay. <laughs> right? It's perceived authority. It doesn't matter what you consider coercive. It only matters what the victim considers coercive. I look at my cops that work for me and I say, I'm a 30-year cop. It's going to have to be a little more than just stand up before I'm going to do it. Right? <laughs> I'm like, no. My knees hurt? No. Make me. <laughs> my, dog. my point is, God, is coercion different for a 50-year-old man than it is a 14-year-old girl? But if you've got a jury of 50-year-old men, now what? How do you prove that coercion? You have to put yourself in the mind of that 14-year-old victim or that 15-year-old girl or that 30-year-old woman. It doesn't matter. You have to put yourself in the mind and consider what she would consider coercive. And with people under 18, perceived authority, perceived reality is just as important as reality. Right? It's amazing to me when I got out of uniform many, many, many years ago. 
And you can still walk up to a car with a command presence and a command voice and tell people to do stuff, and they will. I was 19 years old going in a bar in Winoco, Oklahoma, ordering grown-up people around. And they did. And, and, well, for a minute. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying, guys? Coercion is difficult. So when you see a news article, and we're talking about, uh, well, he told me to do this. And, and you think, well, that's just stupid. I wouldn't have done that. Doesn't matter what you would have done. What matters is what the victim perceives and what their experience in life is like, right? So we've had to teach our officers a lot of empathy, and it'll get worse. I'll tell you why here in just a second. So we've got exploitation, force, fraud, or coercion of vulnerable people. Generally, somebody standing uh, holding a rifle is not terribly vulnerable, right? But and here's where we divide it up. Forced labor, domestic servitude, or commercial sex. Commercial sex, not consensual sex, not survival sex. There's a difference, okay? So in Oklahoma, we divide it up uh, really three ways. We have labor trafficking, we have adult sex trafficking, and we have domestic minor sex trafficking. We see very little uh, maybe just a few instances in the last year of international sex trafficking, but we see lots of adult commercial sex trafficking, okay? And commercial meaning someone has to profit. That profit doesn't necessarily have to be cash. It could be drugs. It could be power or prestige, right? And the closer you get to any sort of capital, uh, the less they want to talk about domestic servitude. We don't want to talk about that, right? Uh, that's the, the lady who's your maid from Honduras and she's got no green card and you pay her a dollar a week. Does that happen in, in amongst some of our folks? Not in Oklahoma, but yeah, that happens, yeah. I have a weird sense of humor, okay? So bear with me, bear with me. So what's the driving force behind human trafficking? driving force behind any crime. Money. It's either sex, revenge, or money. That's it. There's really only three motives for anything, right? But the driving force behind human trafficking is money. These are the drug traffickers who simply change commodities. And I know, ladies, especially talking to the American Association of University Women, it just dawned on me that I called women commodities. Sorry. But in the criminal world, good luck selling somebody that looks like me. You're going to go broke. Right? My point is, guys, they're treated as commodities. That's it. So let's look at it real quickly. Uh, we, my, my boss, um, my big boss was an accountant. And so we do lots of business models. I didn't even know what that was. I had to look it up. <laughs> and we do business models. I, I was very, very familiar with this business model. That's a drug trafficking business model. It makes perfect sense. You buy a quantity of drug for a price. You somehow increase that quantity of drug by cutting it with a dilutant. And now you have a, a drug more valuable than what you paid for it, and you sell it. You can see the business model up there, right? But at the end of that, that kilo of cocaine is gone, and I've made $20,000 uh, profit. So what do I got to do now? I got to go get some more, right? However, we're going to talk about recruitment uh, in a second hour. I recruit a young lady. That purchase price may be nothing, right? It may not cost me anything but time. It may cost me a couple hundred dollars. Uh, if I do the little boyfriend model, um, a couple hundred dollars with the dates, right? Uh, and then uh, at some time or other, guys, this is adult language, so sorry. At some time or other, uh, I, have, I have processed her to the point where she's ready to engage in commercial sex. And we're gonna talk about how that happens in a little bit. But that's called turning her out. 
I'm going to turn her out. I'm going to put her out to work, right? So if I'm a nice guy, 15 times a day, $50 in advance, that's, that's a, a fairly small number of times. That's a fairly cheap price, right? A, a young girl is going to be much more than that. Uh, but you can see where there's a potential for $750 a day, six days a week. If I'm a nice guy, I'm going to let her have one day a week off. Generally not, though, because when you give people time off, it's hard to control their behavior, right? Now I have to make sure she stays in line. So really, what I, if I'm this pimp, okay, let me get this out of the way. I hate that word. We have beautified the word pimp, haven't we? Yeah, everything's pimping. Pimp my ride, and pimping this, and pimping that. And, and we think of Huggy Bear. Remember Dark Skin Hutch? Remember uh, Snoop Dogg or Snoop Lion or Lion or whatever he calls himself now? With, with Huggy Bear, he had the big purple hat with the feather. And he was kind of lovable for a pimp, right? These guys are not lovable. These are violent predators. That's what they do. They take advantage of those weaker than them, even when that weakness is just perceived. Right? They sit on their butts and make money from other people's misery. I'm going to use the word pimp, not because I like it, but because if I call them traffickers, that's a misnomer. They're not all human traffickers. Okay? So we'll get to that. So the nice guy, six days a week, 50 weeks a year, because uh, of vacation and workman's comp, I don't know, uh, $225,000 a year. Minus $25,000, which is a ridiculous amount of expenditure. That is really stupid. Uh, nobody's going to spend that much. Uh, these girls are going to be on their own for rent and food and clothes and stuff. But if I did spend that, uh, uh, that's a couple hundred grand a year per victim. Now, I've got a young lady working for me. She proves reliable. She doesn't run off. Uh, she's not a drug addict. Uh, she's uh, taking care of business. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, it's that domestic violence uh, scenario. Uh, I may beat her occasionally just because I love her. How many of you heard that? He beats me, but he loves me. He loves me. It's my fault. He beat me because I messed up. Right? If she wants to better herself with this guy and lessen the violence, she needs to recruit someone else. How bizarre is that psychology? But it works. Guys, Kirk was talking about uh, uh, graduate programs in psychology. I have met a lot of thuggy, nasty, skanky, street smart pimps who could teach master's level classes in psychology and don't even know why. They know human behavior. They manipulate and control people naturally. There are even handbooks on the internet on how to do it. My point is, at some point, my victim is going to become the victimizer. You recruit someone else to work with us, and now you're the disciplinarian. Your beatings lessen if you make me do good. Make sense? Does that make sense to everybody? You'll have victims become victimizers. And, and they have this twisted mentality when you interview them. <clears throat> Listen, I may beat that girl, I may burn that girl, I may do bad things to that girl, but not near as bad as he would. Make sense? So that's how they justify their behavior. The business model speaks for itself. Very lucrative. I'm, there's going to be a test on this slide, so <laughs> copy this. I just want to give you a glimpse of our statute. We changed Title 21, Section 748. We added it to the kidnapping statute. Kidnapping is not an element of human trafficking. Freedom of movement is there, but we added uh, that. Uh, I just wanted you to see it. No, please, go read it yourself. I've, I've read it once, I think. <laughs> I'm just kidding, it's okay. I'll be your eyes. 
So, let's talk about sex trafficking in Oklahoma. Sex trafficking can be very, very simple. It's one girl with an iPhone uh, and the ability to uh, a car or a ride. That's it. Some prostitutes are not pimp controlled or very loosely pimp controlled. Uh, I know, guys, it, it, it kind of goes against the, the, the grain in North Oklahoma. There are prostitutes engaged in prostitution because they want to be engaged in prostitution. They resent the police, <coughs> they resent the interference with their business, and they're going to pay the $50 bond on the misdemeanor arrest. They're going to walk off and say, so what, I lost some money. Right? Uh, a guy that I have met, and I, I promised him I wouldn't uh, mention him by name, but he wrote an article recently uh, that was published on the internet, and he likened, and, and it, at first I thought, ooh, gosh, I'm, I bet he wishes he hadn't said that. And then I got to thinking about it. The problem right now with the media coverage that we have, there are lots and lots of non-governmental organizations trying to get involved and rescue people. Okay? This guy made the statement, these are not puppies. These prostituted women are not puppies. They will not be grateful and lick your hand. Well, for $50, they'll lick your hand. There was a warning, and I went over it, and now I can't get back on the other side of the line, so I apologize, uh, bless the pygmies or whatever. <laughs> My point is, guys, they don't want to be rescued. Some of these girls don't want to be rescued. They don't consider themselves victims. They consider you in their way. And they will victimize you if they give half an opportunity. They're carrying weapons. They are uh, hepatitis positive, a lot of them. Uh, they, they do not <coughs> consider themselves in danger, right? When, when we first started this, we had a young lady who, who would not identify as a victim, but she wanted a ride to a safe place and promised us that if we got her to this safe place, that, that she would cease her activities for a period of time and, and kind of think about her life, right? So we called uh, a, 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 a organization who was a non-governmental type deal, and they sent one guy, 60 years old, in a pickup truck, to give her a ride halfway across the state. And I said, no. Are you crazy? First of all, she's going to make allegations about your behavior that you're not going to be able to disprove. Second of all, by the end of the trip, she's probably going to have your pickup and your house keys. Right? And you'll be standing on the side of the road in your BBDs. <laughs> These are not, although they are victims of their circumstance, they're not just innocent little children who will love you forever for trying to help them out. That's been my experience. Now, if you meet one that is, outstanding. Please bring her and introduce her to me. But a lot of these young ladies would rather cut you than look at you. We have one uh, on Robinson in Oklahoma City. Uh, they call her, I can't remember exactly what they call her, the brick lady or the brick queen or the brick something. Because she, in the winter, will have a brick under her coat and you, she gets in your car, you negotiate the price, you start to drive off, she hits you in the head with a brick, she has all your money. Yeah, she doesn't like men. <laughs> you think? So, very small to very large organization. One I want to point out real quickly, uh, this was, interestingly, before we even officially had jurisdiction, we weren't really officially uh, had jurisdiction until November 1st, Tulsa and Oklahoma City ran into this deal and they called us and said, you want to go along and learn? Oh, that's, yes. 
my, our first several months of being as a unit before we got official jurisdictions, we went to Las Vegas and we went to Florida and we went to Chicago and we went to Utah. They have prostitutes in Utah. It amazed me. Uh, uh, we went all over the place and we learned. This is what they call the Hispanic brothel method uh, or model. Think about it. I'm an illegal in Oklahoma. Do I want to get caught in a prostitution sting on South Robinson or in Tulsa or on the internet? What happens if I'm a customer and I get caught up in that? What happens to me? If you're illegal, you go back. Could I get deported? They think so, right? So, there's an organization, and they still exist to this day, who uh, imports girls, human smuggling, from Guatemala to Houston. Once they're in Houston, though, are they vulnerable to become victims? Yeah, at that point, they're not even given an opportunity. They are basically bought into servitude they are put on a track, right? They travel from Dallas to Oklahoma City to Tulsa to Kansas City, St. Louis, Wichita, back to Oklahoma City, back to Dallas, back to Tulsa. They travel on that track. They are Guatemalan girls, speak very little English, and their sole job is their sole job is to service the illegal population. So their traffickers will frequent uh, bars and places where illegals congregate. And they are vetting those people by dialect. I have Hispanic agents who speak Spanish, but they're obviously American, right? If you speak Spanish, you know there's a difference. So they're vetting those, those Hispanics by dialect. And if you pass the test, they will sell you a poker chip. And that poker chip gets you admitted to whatever apartment these girls are in right now. So we, we ran into that. A young lady uh, up in the Tulsa area uh, at first was not an unwilling participant, but soon became unwilling when she realized she wasn't gonna get to go home or quit. You can't just say, Dear boss, I resign. That's not working. So she wrote some messages on the bottom of a shoe. And she threw her shoes out the bathroom window. And somebody found them and actually called the police and started this whole thing unraveling. Unfortunately, we only got two of the three apartments in Oklahoma City because a non-governmental made a press release See, when something's this hot, human trafficking right now, man, is just the deal, right? When it's that hot, everybody's tempted to jump on board and get their five minutes of fame. Katie Kurtz, please don't put that on there. Oops. <laughs> right? Do all those shows, all those shows about human trafficking, how many of those daytime celebrities have done specials on human trafficking now? Right? I called yesterday, as a matter of fact, from Sex Slaves in America on MSNBC. I was like, uh, let me think about these questions for a little bit. Because you know me, <laughs> I might say something real stupid. <laughs> so, here are these girls. That they were in Tulsa, they were in Oklahoma City, there was a guy in each apartment <coughs> making sure that they uh, stayed there. They vetted the clients by language. They were uh, catering specifically to illegals, 15 to 20 sexual contacts a day. Uh, they limited their communication. They spent about two weeks in one place, moved to another place. This is why I got into human trafficking, right? This is what we were looking for. This is Liam Neeson. <laughs> Nobody saw that movie. When we first all got put into human trafficking, we all ran out and ran and taken. My daughter to this day, because I lied to her, thinks that I jump off of bridges onto yachts <laughs> and, and wrestle Eric oil sheets for innocent victims, right? And, and 
If I get shot a couple times in the process, it's okay, I'll be all right. You don't have to take a finger in, it'll be all right. Um, not in the real world, guys. Not, not in the real world. But this one was pretty close. Kansas uh, and, and other places. Okay? I bring that up because that's one extreme of the model. That's, that's the one that the media would like you to think is happening all over everywhere. Unfortunately, fortunately, fortunately, it's not happening all over everywhere. All right? This is what's happening all over everywhere. Back page. How many of y'all have seen back page? In a few minutes, we'll take a break. How many of y'all have seen Craigslist? I've bought stuff on Craigslist. Nothing wrong with Craigslist. It's a, it's a web page. For some of you that don't know, uh, when I say web page, it's on the internet. <laughs> you go www.google.com, yeah, whatever, and look up internet. Is that redundant? Think about me. <laughs> My point is, guys, uh, we've all looked at Craigslist, we've all looked at eBay and those kind of things, right? It's an online auction thing. www.backpage.com. You can get on it. It's not porn. Uh, we can get on it on our state computers without IT alarms going off, right? Although, you got to be careful what links you follow off of it. But basically, Backpage has a section, an adult section. And then in the adult section, they have escorts. Sounds <coughs> legit. They have massage parlors. Sounds legit. There's a couple other that don't, not so much legit sounding. They're like fetishes and stuff. We stay out of those. <laughs> you know, toes just don't do it for me. <laughs> Sorry. But on that page, people post ads. Now, that's a very typical ad. My agents, when time permits, uh, will every day check back page. There's about a hundred some odd ads on each spot daily, but we're looking for, and after a few days of looking at that, you start recognizing people and you start recognizing phone numbers. We're building a database of phone numbers. Because if one number appears on four ads, whose number is that? That's the pimp's phone number, right? Is that important to us? Yeah. So the girls will advertise on here. They'll make up some silly stuff here. Uh, they'll put their age on there, uh, and they'll put some stuff. I offer unrushed top quality service. Um, but they are not advertising for sex. You are paying them for companionship. What happens after that is between two consenting adults. Now, if you believe that, I got a whole bunch of people I want to introduce you to. That's not, why, if I were paying for a companion, would I really care what she looked like in her under drawers? Right? Why are they posing like that? Well, why do you think? That's a self-answering question. For, for the men, anyway, for the ladies, maybe a guy will explain it to you later. No, I'm just kidding. My point is, my guys look at those. Now, I'm not going to insult anybody, but we are looking for a couple things. Mostly what we see are older ladies trying to look younger. No offense, right? But we also see young girls trying to look a little older. And so we're looking for physical characteristics of minors, under 18. If you are under 18, you cannot legally consent to commercial sex. You can consent at 16 to uh, sex, right? But if it's commercial, if there's money exchange, 18 is the age of consent. So we're looking for uh, prepubescent sort of physical characteristic. We're looking for slim hips. We're looking for artificial breasts. 
I never thought in 30 years of law firm that I would stand in front of an audience and say, I'm looking for an artificial breath. But we're looking for wigs, right? We're looking for girls who have tried to alter their appearance makeup to look older than they are. Mostly that doesn't happen. But we have on occasion uh, uh, found some that were young. So what we will do occasionally is this. I, I've messed with this so much, I don't even know what's on it. What we will do occasionally is this. We simply go rent a hotel room or two or three. Uh, we uh, start calling. Start, we pick the youngest ones first that look the youngest, right? We look for clues on their back page ad. Their back page ad is gonna be specific. Right? If it says, I heart white boys, that means they are pimp controlled. Right? If it says, I heart white boys are no AA, no African American, that means there's a pimp telling them, I don't want you messing with black guys. Right? That sounds racist. It's not my rule, it's their rule. They don't want other pimps trying to take their commodity, right? So it'll say, I heart white guys or whatever. Uh, they'll also put disclaimers. I love these. Uh, they do, they put them on there. If you're in law enforcement, you are not allowed to call me. <laughs> if if uh, you are paying for roses and companionship, the companionship, I understand, but the roses, they have to go buy themselves later, right? But it says right on it. Now, a lot of the disclaimers, if you're in law enforcement and you call me, that's entrapment. How many years did we deal with that in the drug trade? You know if you're a cop, you have to tell me. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, you're good enough. And then they'd be like, okay, stupid, are you a cop? No. And then, and then, and then you arrest them and they go, but you said you weren't a cop. I lied. <laughs> I'm a drug dealer. So my conscience is clear. <laughs> but then you see what I'm saying, guys? And, they, and, they, and then they show up. So they show up, and, and, and at that point, we got a, a little uh, dance. The undercovers, and they have a little dance, and they, they say, they need to offer to engage in commercial sex. So they'll do stuff. They'll do stuff. They'll be like, if you're uh, not a cop, you have to touch my breath. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what a job. <laughs> but but, but think, for some reason, they think there's a rule. <laughs> and they do. They think there's a rule. And we generally polite look back of the hand. <laughs> but but guys, you see what I'm saying? All of that is showing us a pattern of behavior. If it was a massage or companionship, why would she care if you're in law enforcement? She wouldn't. So we've got to document every bit of that. All right. At some point, uh, she's then placed under arrest. It's a misdemeanor. Uh, we're going to take her to another room. We've got a, a, a very, very nice very empathetic uh, uh, young lady, agent, who's gonna sit down. That becomes the part where we are trying to convince her that she's a victim. Are you pimp controlled? Nope. Nope. Nobody can tell me what to do. Is anybody forcing you to do this? Is anybody defrauded you? Is anybody coercing you to do this? Please, let us help you. There's one certified shelter in the state of Oklahoma. Right now, right now, certified shelter in Tulsa. There's fixing to be, fixing to be, I've been here too long. There's fixing to be another one in Oklahoma City uh, in the next few weeks. That is our ultimate goal. I somewhat disagree with the statute. And this is gonna sound hardcore, I'm sorry. If you wanna be a victim, you need to give me the name of the person victimizing you. I'm sorry, because what they're learning is, I'm a victim, I go to the shelter, I stay the night, 
Nobody bothered me. I leave. There's nothing we can do to make them stay there. It's not a lockup. It's not a facility we can force them. They're adults. If they're under 18, they are immediately victims. However, they don't have to name their victim either. So we're back to square one. Right now the statute is, if you're six, well, right now the statute is they go to DHS. Uh, and DHS takes custody of that person and is going to figure out whether they need to be in a facility or whether they can give them to a parent or family member, right? They cannot put them in the same facility with 10 and 11 year old uh, abuse victims. Can you see why? Huh? They cannot put them in the same shelter as uh, middle-aged uh, women who are victims of domestic abuse in a violent shelter. Can't put them there. They would walk out with a check. Do you understand? They can tell you such a story that you would give them anything. And, and women who have been subjected to domestic violence who are in those shelters are susceptible. They're in that frame of mind. They can't maybe be helped, but they maybe want to help somebody else. You see what I'm saying? God, I'm, I'm not battering on, on a prostitute. I'm just saying there's the real world and there's what we see on TV. So we've got these shelters. Uh, give me one minute and, and I will take a, 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 we'll, we'll take five minutes or so and go to the restroom and wherever. Um, the hardest part for me to teach uh, my young officers and myself, we've been used to deal with drug traffickers. We don't do interviews with drug traffickers. I give you money, you give me dope, you go to jail, I don't want to see you again. I don't need to interview you, right? Unless I want to know where you got your dope from and you're going to lie to me anyway. Okay? But interviewing these girls, there's a, there's a very special skill. They have to think that you're empathetic without appearing weak. Men can interview them too, by the way. Right? But... Here's a, a real quick story. Is anybody else hearing that? <laughs> <laughs> I I slide down the pole again. When I was a freshman, in, I was a freshman. I, I may have, I may have gone to the nightlight a few times. <laughs> and I think I damaged some stuff. <laughs> so I hear things. Okay. A couple weeks ago, Friday afternoon, uh, we get a call. Uh, truck stop. A uh, parent, 16-year-old girl, uh, 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 getting in a truck, spending some time, coming back out. We get a great vehicle description. We get a great description of the truck. Uh, call the trucking company, and they are more than happy to give us the truck driver's cell phone number. <laughs> call the truck driver, who apparently does not realize that it's against the law, and just dumped it. Go, yeah, heck yeah, I was going to hire this little young lady was advertising on that page uh, and responding to call-outs at a truck stop. Pretty typical sort of thing, right? I got a good description of the vehicle, and then in typical truck driver fashion, he knew where she was staying, but he didn't know the street, he knew the highway and exit. <laughs> you ever talk to a truck driver? Now she's staying off the exit 145. Really? You know what the exit 145 is? Meridian. Yeah, I don't know. What's on Meridian? Oh, yeah. So, I'm a trained investigator. So, I, I, we, we go there on Meridian, and dang, right there, Biltmore. Boom. There it is. There's the truck. Oh, my gosh. What if this is just, this doesn't happen to me. So, uh, how are we going to figure out what room she's in? Uh, my, my partner there, he's asking, how are we going to figure out what room she did? I said, well, I don't know. She's standing right there. Let's ask her. <laughs> <laughs> she walked out back in the truck. This never happens. So I'm in a great mood. Right? This is all just boom, boom, boom. She comes. We, we walk over to her. Okay. All right. I got to shoot the face now. I got a 23-year-old daughter. Right? First of all, she's not 16. She's 26. Okay, but, but I can see she's a tiny little thing, so you could be confused. 
and we interview her. And my first reaction to everything she says, she, she wells up in tears. She uh, looks at me like a basset hound. And she says, this is the first time I've ever done it. <laughs> like, y'all are hard. Y'all are hard. Did you hear that laughing? I was like, I'm sure it is. First time you've ever done it. I'm sorry we bothered you. No. But I really, really, really wanted to believe it. I really did. In my heart, I wanted to believe it. In 15 minutes, we had found out, oh, and she had a Yukon uh, address on her driver's license. And, and I lived near there. And so I thought, this could be my baby right here, right? Well, okay, as Paul Harvey says, here's the rest of the story. She's a 26-year-old IV drug user. She's shooting up methamphetamine in her veins. She's hepatitis C positive. <coughs> Uh, she's from Michigan, but she's got uh, warrants there, lots of warrants there, so she can't go back. Uh, she's got a baby there that she can't see because of the warrants, right? And she's using a Yukon address because that's the first one she saw, and she just got a driver's list of that address on. She's been on that page for about, oh, four years, not once about 150 or 200 times probably. You understand what I'm saying, guys? It's so easy to get sucked in. Is she a victim? Bad, bad. She made bad, bad decisions at some point. Is she a victim of human trafficking? No. She was totally self-contained. Nobody, no force, no fraud, no coercion, no pimp. Just running her back, pay dad, make it a living. But what really turned the tide for me was, I know about what she was making a day. And what I found out in Michigan was those warrants were only about $1,500 we were taken care of. So she really wanted to go see her baby and go home. Could she have made that money and paid those fines and gone back? But she instead chose to stay here and buy drugs. You see what kind of thing we're dealing with? We'll talk a little bit about labor trafficking. And, and I'm trying not to get all tremendously technical and detailed, Ruth, because uh, I know she's up there. He's just telling the story. But uh, earlier this summer, we ran into a huge issue that cost me several days of work. Uh, and it kind of started in Oklahoma in Sand Springs. And it kind of started mostly because of this little invention called Facebook. I'm going to give you a little secret. Not everything on Facebook is true. <laughs> I know, girl, I know. You're like, but it said on Snopes that it was okay. There's a company called Southwestern Advantage. They sell, this is crazy, textbooks. I know, I know. Who would think it? And they have been in existence since just after the Civil War, since the 1870s. So they're legit. They're headquarters in Nashville, and or uh, what's the one where they play the Nashville? Oh, he's Nashville Memphis mixed up. I don't know why. They're in Nashville, and they recruit college kids to go sell textbooks door to door to people that are homeschooling or, or need tutoring or have kids that need extra books, right? So uh, these kids work on commission. And if you, have you ever been to Mathis Brothers? The lower kids. <laughs> commission equals aggressive, right? I stop them at the door. Listen, I am armed. <laughs> Follow me. I will shoot you. Give me your card. If I want to buy a chair, I will call you. Five minutes later, they're peeking around pillars. <laughs> Hate that. Hate that. In fact, one of them now is advertising that they won't follow you around. My point is, guys, they're aggressive. 
because they're on commission. So unfortunately, a few years ago, uh, Southwestern Advantage made the, the, the mistake of just after human trafficking became a topic, they went to Estonia. Estonia is a, a former Soviet bloc country near Russia, and they recruited college kids to come to the United States. What a cool deal. They get to sell stuff, they get to make tuition money, and they get to see the USA. I know it's hard for you to believe, but some people enjoy seeing the USA, right? They came here. And the next thing you know, these poor girls, they're Eastern European girls, they're knocking on doors, and people in San Friends are chasing them <coughs> down the street, accusing them of being victims of human trafficking and <coughs> begging them to be rescued. <laughs> Please stop chasing me. I don't want to be rescued. I'm trying to sell textbooks. And then it got crazy. They're, they're <coughs> Google mapping neighborhoods, and they're marking, and they're asking bizarre questions like, do your neighbors have kids? Maybe because they're selling textbooks. And if you don't have kids, do you need them? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? It'd be kind of, you know, it'd be like trying to sell me donuts. How easy would that be? Jenny Craig, on the other hand, not so much. I'm not in the market. But do you understand what I'm getting at? Sometimes they're just selling magazines. Sometimes it's just the Alva High Gold Bug Band kids selling fruitcake or whatever they have to sell. We had to sell fruitcake. It was the god awful worst thing you ever tasted. <laughs> Did you get what I'm saying? Now, are there magazine sales crews that are borderline human trafficking? We had an example of that young girl in Kingfisher meets a guy, I don't remember where she's working, she meets a guy and he says, you like to party? Yeah, I like to party. You want to see the country? Yeah, I want to see the country. You want to make a lot of money? Yeah, I want to make a lot of money. I fell for that one time. It was Amway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Please help me now. So he recruits her. She goes. They take these kids out of state. Now here's where it gets tricky. Here's where it gets tricky. They're only 16 or older. Normally 18 or older, actually, because the 16 year old comes with his own sets of problems. The company is normally out of Florida or New York. These are Russian organized crime groups, is what they are. The crew members are moved away from home. They have a quota to meet. They are put in a motel. They have X coming out of their quota for motel, X coming out of their quota for uh, food, uh, the, you know, spam and beanie weenies or whatever they can get locally at, at a store. They're not going to um, uh, Taco Village in mass and eating, right? Uh, that's what I didn't do today, Kurt. I didn't go to Taco Village. They, 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 their cell phones are taken away from them. And they don't have the ability to communicate with home. Okay? Is that borderline human trafficking? Yes. We're getting there. We're looking at force fraud and coercion. We're looking at exploitation of a vulnerable person for forced labor or domestic servitude or commercial sex. One of the key giveaways on these companies is, do they make you watch promotional material? Yeah. Every morning we get up, we have to watch the video. That's, that's a dead giveaway right there. Right? It's that brainwashing. You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And, and what is the other cover that they're operating under is, if I can sell grandma, right, three magazine subscriptions to Playboy, Sports Illustrated, stuff that she doesn't want or need. But how easy is it to exploit other vulnerable people for that kind of stuff? And if I can talk grandma into paying with a credit card, or a personal check, right? Now what do I have? I got all kinds of numbers on grandma all of a sudden. Grandma probably got a couple of dollars in the bank, right? I've got an identity theft thing going. Make sense? And it happens, and it happens. The other thing that they will do, <coughs> even if the company employees are legitimate, 
even if they're not victims, and even if you really wanted that subscription to Better Dogs and Gardens. I bought it because I wanted it. Watch your credit card bill. Because I paid $19.99 for that, and it comes across on my credit card bill as $24.99. Now, no big deal. I work for the state, so that would probably break me. That's five bucks, right? I mean, it would at least get my butt kicked by my wife. Five dollars! Right? But what did they just do? I'm going to look at them and figure, well, you know, maybe it's a, like a fee or a tax or a, I don't know, taxes apply in Connecticut or something. I don't know how. So I figured, oh, okay. But what they just did is they overcharged 100,000 people five bucks. How many of those people are going to look at that bill and call them? Nobody is. Is that a money maker? Absolutely. So we look at these. We look at these companies. We, we interview these kids. I told an audience this one time, and a guy came up to me after class. He said, you're a moron. I oh, I know, but why do you say that? And, and, and he said, you think like a cop, and you're going to get somebody hurt. Oh, what do you mean? You're telling these people to do stuff that's law enforcement, and they need to not do that. And I, so I had to kind of think about what I had said. What I had said was, when one of those kids comes to your door, don't let them in the house. Don't let them in the house. Don't let anybody in the house that you don't want in the house, right? If I want a magazine, I'm probably going to go Walmart and buy it. But my point is, they're in there. Uh, they're going to be creatures of opportunity. But I asked the audience to just simply ask a couple questions. Do you uh, talk to your mom and dad? Do you get to talk to your mom and dad? What's the name business? Okay. You're 18? Yeah. You have a cell phone? No. How many 18 year old kids in the world do not have cell phones? <laughs> How many 18 year old kids in Oklahoma don't have a cell phone? Seriously. I mean, nowadays it's like you got go, 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 and you hand them a cell phone. <laughs> Make sense? Now, if you are not comfortable doing that, then here's a common sense little tip for you. Don't. But my man here, pretty sure he can ask a question and they ain't going to go, I'm fixing to whip your butt. They ain't going to do it. They ain't going to do it. My point is, the more information you can gather, and, 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 and look at things in a common sense sort of way, and then call the police, right? It helps. Now, the police in, um, ooh, I have to be careful, uh, in uh, Attica, Kansas, <laughs> may respond, and they may not know any more about it than you do, and they may go, are you a human trafficking victim? Well, I know I'm not. Have a nice day. <laughs> right? And then they may arrest everybody, take them to the station, only to find out there's been no violation of criminal law. And they have to uh, apologize and let everybody go. Right? We've all been as police at both ends of those stories. I was at Winoka PD for a year. I, I, I didn't know, sick them from get them, right? <laughs> My point is, if you feel that you can answer these questions either in your own mind or by talking, right? And oh, guys, I, you have to be so careful. I, I gave a little deal to some, <coughs> some of our agents, and I said, this is, ask these questions. And, and I get a call on the noon hour. One of my guys has got this kid in an arm bar. He's drugging down the driveway. He's got he's sitting on him in the driveway. He won't answer my questions. So I got him. I got him. I'm sitting on him. Oh crap. Get up. Get up now. Brush him off. Apologize. Send him on his way. We don't tackle people and force them to answer questions. No. Do they have freedom of movement? Do they live and work in the same place? Do they, are they all in one hotel room? That particularly applies to something else. Do they owe a debt to their employer? Are you behind? 
in your quota to where now you're in the red? What legitimate business practice does that? Oh, I know, Northwestern, right? <laughs> How many classes did you teach, Kurt? You owe us money. No, but do you understand what I'm saying, guys? I didn't make my quarter today, so to eat, they're going to front me some money. So tomorrow, my quarter is extended, and by the end of the week, I owe them $500, and I'm still working. Is that a common business model? If you talk to a young person and that's what they're experiencing, is that a problem? Yeah. They may or may not be a victim of human trafficking. They may just be a victim of a really bad decision like to go off with this company, right? So uh, what other places might live and work in the same place? No, but you're thinking. Um, I need to get my cuticles done. Does anybody know where a nail salon might be? Might they be victims of human trafficking? They very well might. That's a huge problem in the state of Oklahoma. Or I have a, uh, a spasm in my spazitza coin, and I gotta go to a massage parlor. Might they be victims of human trafficking? Might they also be a front for prostitution? Okay, let me, let me clarify. Most nail salons are not fronts for, <laughs> for, for prostitution. Dudes, don't go to the nail salon and ask for anything extra. <laughs> You'll get your toenails clipped down to the quick. <laughs> but my, my point is, do the workers have control over their documents? Do they just play trot sign the trial of <coughs> These are incredibly difficult cases. First of all, there's generally a language barrier. We have an IT lady who speaks Mandarin Chinese. She's been invaluable. But second of all, think about it. Debt bondage. I, I'm not familiar with where I'm at. Debt bondage. Uh, debt bondage. I pay, uh, somebody offers to bring me to the United States to work for them, but it's gonna cost $5,000. So I agree, they pay the money, I fly here, they put me to work in the nail salon, uh, Fred's nail salon. And, and I don't speak English, they give me a room in the back, or we all share an apartment. I owe 5,000, I owe $20 a day for the booth, $5 a day for the supplies, uh, and I may, if I'm lucky, I split the take with the, with the uh, salon. I don't know what it costs. $500 to get your nails done. I don't know. I, I think that's right. Is that about right? Uh, and so the girl gets some and the house gets some. How fast am I going to be able to pay that money back? <laughs> Never. In fact, by the end of the week, I'm behind. Right? So, do they live there? Not all massage parlors are sexually oriented. A bunch of them are, right? If they live and work in the same place, that's a clue. If they are not certified massage technicians or whatever, however, they ain't got a thing on the wall that says, I hereby am certified. What is it, 3,000 hours you have to go to to be a massage tech? It's a big deal, right? If they walk in the room naked. <laughs> it's happened. It's happened. It's happened. We, 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 we went in. We had an undercover. We had to rescue him. He was screaming. He was literally running around the room. Get this crazy off of me. And, and, uh, we thought. She was a customer because she was naked. And, and we're like, where is she? And he, he's right there. And I said, do you always give massage with the clothes off? She said, well, when it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, guys, the, the massage colleges, the, you know what's a legitimate business. You know, if it's, uh, somebody who's lived here their whole life, right, and they open a business, 
and, and, and they've gone to school and hired legitimate, that, that's probably okay. But if it's Fred's school of tonsillary and massage <laughs> therapy, mm, mm, we need to look at that just a little bit. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you one other real quick one. We, we are, uh, arrested a, a lady in a parlor, an Asian parlor in War Acres. And then there was some funny stuff going on financially with the credit cards and stuff. So we stopped what we were doing. We got a search warrant. And that was going to take a while. And so a couple hours later, we were still there uh, working this case. And a taxi pulled up. And, and another worker from another parlor uh, was sent to relieve her. But the other parlor was in Tulsa. So the girl had no way to get there. So she took a cab from Tulsa to War Acres. <laughs> Yeah, about a two hundred and fifty dollar cab ride. Uh, I guess I don't know, but uh, my point is, guys, we we, we watched these massage parlors. They sprung up like wildfire in Long. Why? No, why? Seriously, why? What else? Yeah, and I'm not saying military guys are bad guys, but you got young guys away from home. They're by themselves, right? All right. What's going on in Alma? I'm not saying old workers are bad guys. Okay, they're not. My dad were one for me. Right? But what? You got guys, you have young guys, they're away from home, they maybe don't have a home, they're here in town, they got young guys in <coughs> purchase. There's 12 women here in town, so no, I'm just joking. Come on, guys, that was a joke. It's all right. It's okay. He's 12 at the nightlight. I know, I count. <laughs> and I married one, so now there's only 11. <laughs> oh, come on. So, let's put a face to it. Let's put a face to it. This was, uh, uh, and that's not a real name, but that's a real person. And she really were 14. And, and this is one of our inspirational uh, girls. This was a victim of human trafficking. She did not want to be where she was at. She did not want to do what she was doing. She had a horrible life at home. She didn't want to be at home. She was victimized. She was a victim of human trafficking. She wasn't able to totally help us make a case on the, on the trafficker, but she came close. She, she cooperated, right? And had still maintained a little bit of that innocence that you like to see with 14 year olds, right? I couldn't tie my shoes at 14, <laughs> right? I, well, I was only a couple years older than the sheriff's office. But <laughs> this one, on the other hand, uh, Monique was caught up at the Skirvin in Oklahoma City. Uh, uh, anytime there's an event in Oklahoma City, you will see a huge increase in back page ads. Thunder games, uh, football games at Norman. I know, I know, I know. Football games at OSU too. I don't want to play favorites. Uh, anytime there's an event, you're going to see these girls. These girls are going to come from Kansas City even for Thunder games. Uh, there's a lot of people in Bricktown. There's a lot of guys in Bricktown. There's a lot of guys drinking, partying, wanting to have a good time. That's what they're going to go looking for. Uh, I won't say a lot about Monique except for uh, she would rather cut you than look at you. Very street tough, very street tough. Uh, just amazing. At 16, at 16 years old. At 16 years old, I was trying to sneak in the house five minutes after curfew. <laughs> I was such a bad boy, such a bad boy. <laughs> All right, high risk victims. I'm a, uh, this is important. Who, who could be potentially a victim? And the number one factor we see nationwide and if you'll notice, I don't do a, hardly any statistics because there aren't any. If you read statistics in the news, question, question, question. Where did they come from? How did they get that number? For example, when I first started this in November, we were told by a member of the legislature who was innocently repeating what he'd heard that Oklahoma was fourth in the nation in human trafficking. Oh, that's terrible. 
How do they know that? We haven't worked it yet. <laughs> do, do you know what I'm saying? If Alba PD never made a DUI arrest, then Alba would not be ranked among the top in the state in DUIs. If everybody every day made DUI arrest, Alba would be number one in DUIs. It's, it's crime stats are generally what laws we were enforcing and where we're enforcing them. So we got to look at that. And what we found out was just fascinating. The federal government was the only ones looking at human trafficking at the time, in the early 2000s. And there was a company in Tulsa uh, that manufactured farm equipment. And the name of it was the Pickle Company. And when I first read about it, I thought they made pickles, but they made farm equipment. And they imported 62 or three folks from India to work for them. And they immediately deprived them of all their immigration documents, their ability to travel in the United States. They had them build their own dormitory, and then they put them to work. Uh, so bad that one guy literally dropped a big piece of steel on his foot, crushed his foot, and they treated it uh, with antibiotic and band-aids that they got at Walmart. They didn't want to take him to a hospital because somebody may ask him some questions. What do you do? Right? Somebody got away. Actually, I can't remember. This is awful. I can't remember if he was at an AA meeting or a church. <laughs> uh, I, can't, I can't remember. He went to some meeting, and I can't remember. Somehow I have AA in my head, but I think he went to church. I think he was a Christian. That's what it was. Craig told me he was a Christian. He went to church. And, and he finally told somebody. And they called the, the federal government, the FBI investigated. Okay. Obvious, obvious violation, human traffickers. Company executives are human traffickers. But now I have a problem. I have 61 witnesses who are here on a work visa. But they're not working anymore. So what do I do with them? No, I can't deport witnesses. And how am I going to prosecute Kate? So, did I see she what I do is I grant them a temporary visa. The government had what we call T visas. And they grant them a temporary visa. And I track witnesses in criminal prosecutions by T visas. Oklahoma had no T visas for years. And then in 2002, 62. Fourth in the nation in human trafficking. You see where I'm going with that? That's what happened. It was one case. You know that case is still going on today? Oh, wow. That the 60 some odd people, some of whom are still here, sued the Pickle Company, got a judgment. The Pickle Company appealed it. The, the victim sued them again. And that's still going on to this day. They, you, you don't get judgments from companies. You don't. They don't have to pay it. So, interesting. 2013, case is still pending. But that's, see how I'm saying, when we look at stats, how can we report? I had another guy, real quickly, guy calls me and he says, uh, I, I, he's mad. Somebody from a church had come to his community, his county, and made a speech to the Kiwanis or the lions or the mooses or somebody and said, uh, this county is second in the state, only behind Tulsa County, in human trafficking. And the sheriff called me furious. He said, Mike, I don't even know what it is. I don't know what it is. How could we be second in the state? He said, I looked in my jail book. He never arrested anybody for it. Should we be arresting people for it? Is it happening right in front of us and we don't know about it? Help me. You see what I'm saying? One, one just kind of loose lip sort of comment. And now he's having to answer to the county commissioners about why aren't you arresting anybody? And I told him, and I mean this with all sincerity, and Ruth, you could quote me on this. The statistics in Oklahoma are where we're working. We went down by Ardmore and made 30 some odd arrests in two days. We went to Lawton and made 20, 30 arrests in a couple days. We went to Miami and made 42 arrests in four days. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. It's not hard. Most of them are misdemeanors. We're looking for victims. But right now, we're the four 
biggest centers for human trafficking in the state. Ardmore, Lawton, Ottawa County, there ain't nothing there. There's nothing there. Uh, uh, Seneca and a casino. That's it. Do you see what I'm saying, guys? So be careful what you read on statistics. High risk are juveniles of multiple runaway events. High risk. Why? Are they making themselves vulnerable? Are they making themselves exploitable? That's another problem we deal with every day. Runaways are not all victims of human trafficking. Mm, not happening. If a girl goes missing, immediately call her. We're not the missing persons unit. We are investigating one. Uh, uh, I can't say that. Uh, we can't go, we'll leave it at that. So what we are working on is this. In Oklahoma law enforcement, if I run away in Warica, or Rico Police Department makes a report. Goes in the computer. Somebody contacts you in a few days. Oh, that, 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 she's running, right? So my family's, I don't like Warica. Three weeks later, they moved to uh, Duncan. A runaway in Duncan. Uh, Duncan PD makes a report. It goes on the computer. Somebody may contact you. There's nowhere where all those reports come together, right? So. Every jurisdiction is doing their own thing. So what we have copied from Dallas Police Department is all, and it's not done yet, oh my gosh. You get 10 IT people in a room. Yeah. Oh, no offense, Bob. But, oh, oh, oh. The Spinicta boink won't hook up to a Dell computer, and I don't know, I don't know. It, yeah. What we're trying to do is get all runaway reports will come to the Oklahoma Beer Narcotic. We're not going to investigate those runaway reports. No, 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 no. That's the cops on the street. That's their job. Okay? But we're going to put parameters on it. If you have more than three events in six months or more than four events in a year, we haven't decided yet. We'll see what the numbers look like. Right? That's going to flag that kid. We're going to pull up everything we can about that kid. We're going to find a responsible adult, a guardian, a mom, a dad, an aunt, or uncle, somebody, the kid. We're going to team up with a multidisciplinary team, DHS, <coughs> child welfare, us, somebody. We're going to do interdiction on that kid before they become a victim. Is it going to work? I don't have a clue. I don't know. But it's better than waiting until they're already a victim. So we're going to try that. We don't have it done yet. There's a bunch of IT guys have a bunch of meetings. Uh, they got slide rules and pencils. I don't know. They're no kidding. They're eventually. Uh, they'll, eventually they'll figure it out. So, doodles with few social anchors and kids engaging in survival sets. We have young women out on the street, runaways, who are engaging in sex to survive. They engage in sex for food. They engage in sex for money. They engage in bus tickets, whatever, and doesn't, they're not prostitutes. They're doing what they gotta do to survive. Does that make them vulnerable? Okay, the last thing I wanna point out about that particular slide, uh, I will put that one stat in there, although I don't agree with it. The, the, the National Center for the Missing and Exploited Children says that the average age of entry in prostitution is 12 to 14. I have trouble with that because of the word average. I was an English lit major, and words mean things to me, and we shouldn't use them lightly. Average means then there was six-year-olds and 17-year-olds, and we came to a 12. I don't do math, so that's probably fuzzy. I don't, I don't but, but you know what I'm saying? I, it, they would say common entry age or routine or what I might but but that's that's the, the word right there that, uh, and, and I want to make one comment before we look at some some real quick hard stats social anchors I talked today to the middle school and the high school uh, and and guys I chickened out I did I chickened out bad I cannot talk to middle school kids about sex I have no problem with it, but I do have a problem when parents call my boss. <laughs> I think they're ready. The one of the teachers kind of chastised me a little bit. She said, I know they're only sixth graders, but they're sexting. 
And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but nobody's going to believe that little innocent Susie and little innocent Johnny had to listen to that mean old guy from OBN talking to them about filth. Because I've heard it, right? So I talked to him about internet safety and kind of threw the S word in there a little bit. Okay, my point is social anchors and kids in 2013 would be a tremendous research paper for somebody in a sociology program. Hint, hint. Right? <laughs> Think about it. Can you be apparently successful in school, in young adulthood, in juvenilia, however, whatever? Can you be apparently successful and be socially isolated? Can you? Can we have 5,000 friends on Facebook and be socially isolated? Oh, I argue that it's way worse than ever because we don't have real friends. We have Facebook friends. We were investigating a case, so we made a fake Facebook page. Still have it. It's cool. It's the top of somebody's head. It's a girl. It's like the top of her head. You can't even see what she looks like. And everything on there is totally fictitious. Name, age, everything. Likes, dislikes. We made this person fairly eclectic. They, they, they like some weird crap. We have 200 friends. We have 200 friends on Facebook who are a person who doesn't exist, never existed. Can you believe that? And they're not all kids. Some of them are grown up people who are friending people that they don't know. We get friend requests. <laughs> and we go, okay, we don't know them. Right? It, it does that. Can you be the head of the football team, the head of the soccer team, the head cheerleader, the president of the student body, the, the whatever, and still be socially isolated? Still be lonely? Because predators online are only looking for one thing. They're only looking for people that are unhappy. That's it. That's, that boils it all down in that nutshell. Uh, my life sucks. I hate my parents. Your parents don't understand you like I do. Boom. They just drove a wedge. You're their friend. Their parents are the enemy. And it goes from there. There's a new game now. I'll let somebody else talk to you about it, Kirk or somebody. Uh, there's a new game. We were talking about it at dinner. Uh, Internet Crimes Against Children. Uh, that's not my venue, but, but there's competition to see how, uh, adult males, how many pictures of naked women can they get sent to them uh, on text. And, and it's amazing, the psychology involved. And, and I'm, we're trying to tell kids once it's on there, it's on there. You, 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 it's gone. You can't get it back. Once you hit send, it's like the email I accidentally cc my boss. <laughs> it's gone. Bob could, no way, couldn't get it back. Oops. Or my wife talking. She was talking about my daughter's boyfriend to my daughter-in-law and accidentally texted it to my daughter, too. <laughs> <laughs> Fire works it all right. <laughs> it was cool. Find it to nothing. <laughs> oh, yes. I just sat back and... <laughs> they were fighting. Okay, there's one facility in Oklahoma. These are the last stats that we're done. These are the stats I want to share with you. There's one facility certified in Oklahoma. None others. Uh, a gal named Wilma Lively runs it. Wilma Lively is a saint wearing shoes. She is probably the best person I've ever met. She is just a great person. She has a heart, but she's not stupid. She has compassion, but she's not easy. You understand what I'm saying? She knows how to help people. So she has taken, since the inception of her facility, uh, and this isn't totally current because I got this about a month ago. Uh, she's taken more since then. But she has taken in 38 young women, women, all over the age of 17 because she can't handle juveniles, right? Uh, she had one 17-year-old who had been uh, pronounced an adult by the court, so she could take a 17-year-old. Uh, and she has a series of questions. And since we have become friends, I kind of asked her to modify it a little bit and ask some questions for us too. And, and those are, of course, scholars, self-reporting surveys. So, you know, 
uh, that's like the drug surveys we do for the high school kids. The ones that are smoking weed think that we can get DNA off of it and CSI is gonna kick in their door by the end of the day. So, so there's self-reported surveys. Interesting what we found out, 68% uh, of the survivors uh, were white, 50% black, 50% multiracial, 30% American Indian, 3% Latino. Now, kind of follows along the racial profile of Oklahoma, right? The Latina uh, number is a little probably low. It's a little bit low. I'm gonna make a racist statement, so sue me. In my experience, Latina victims and Latina in general have a family structure that they can sometimes rely on rather than go into a shelter run by strangers. If you disagree with me, great, I'll be in the parking lot later. Let's get it on. <laughs> okay, you see what I'm saying? But, but that's been my experience in 30 years in law enforcement. Generally, they're not very eager to go to a shelter run by strangers. They're, they're gonna more rely on family. My experience. 32% uh, married, 68% single or divorced. The age ranges. Look at that. Anywhere from 17 to 45. 17 to 45. Now, now this is a, a, a 38 rescued women. These are not all of the women. These are not any, any meant to be representative of anything in particular. Just interesting to me. Interesting to me uh, what we were looking at. So we can't say any particular age. Uh, they're pretty evenly spread. Eight of them uh, dropped out of school in 7th and 9th grade, 8, uh, 10th and 11th grade, 9 graduate high school, 2 had uh, a GED, 10 had some college, 1 lady had a master's degree. So, Kurt, just hope for you. Uh, 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 you can only imagine what her lifestyle choices must have been. How did she end up? In that situation, she made some kind of bad decisions, right? So, 61% had children. Uh, 23 had children. I can't tell. 54 children in total. Only 12 of those 64 children were living with the mother. The cool thing about women's shelter is, if you have young, young children, they can stay with mom in the shelter until they, they get medical help, they get dental help, they get legal help, they get psychological help, they get some kind of job placement a little bit, uh, just some general help to get back and go. 71% suicide attempts at 12, 17, 15, and 13, or 33. Fifty-one percent had been choked or strangled, either by the pimp or by a customer, or by, um, the bottom bitch. The bottom bitch is the girl in the stable who controls the other girls. We talked about victims becoming victimizers. That's her title. She wears it. She wears it with pride. Uh, sometimes they have it tatted on them, uh, tattooed on them somewhere. They'll have their pimp's name and they'll have BB or something similar to that, a uh, symbol that means to them that they're running the show. Uh, when their pimp goes to prison, a lot of times they're running the show until he gets out. Interesting about that. So, 37% had not been these just because they child, 10% uh, wouldn't say, I'm not sure why, 53% had been in DHS custody as a child. Not great childhood. I have some, some issues there we can kind of see. 68% had current probation, parole, and court dates. Okay, 29% uh, did not, one wouldn't say because probably had warrants. <laughs> no, I'm not, I know. I'm telling you, I got a warrant. You got 50% were admitted to that facility currently using uh, uh, antidepressants. Right? That's kind of an interesting thing for a drug cop. Okay, there's a whole nother series of questions. There's a whole nother series of questions that was designed for victims of domestic abuse. It's called a lethality index. And some of you academics know what I'm talking about, but, but basically it's a series of questions, and depending on your answer, you are ranked in a lethality index, uh, how much life expectancy you might have. With very little modification, it was modified to victims of sex trafficking, 
right? Because really, they're subjected to the same sorts of assaults, but they have two or three assailants, not just a husband. They have customers, they have a pimp, and sometimes just street people and other girls that they deal with on their corner. So uh, 30 of the 38 agreed to take this other test. All of them were in the top two ranks of lethality index, meaning that if they were in the 94 plus percent, dangerously lethal, women was telling them they had probably a year to live if they stayed on the street and stayed what they were doing. Uh, if they were in the uh, 37, 93, Wilma was telling them they got in a couple of years. If they don't change what's going on with them. These girls get beaten, they get uh, raped, you, they get raped, uh, they get assaulted, and sometimes they have to defend themselves by taking a line. Uh, South Robinson is not, it's what we used to call the track in Oklahoma City, where you actually see prostitutes walking on the street to attract customers, that has gone out of style very quickly. It's very dangerous, it's very obvious to the police, right? Uh, and we don't see that much anymore. The internet and South Meridian are replacing that very quickly, right? We just don't see street walkers anymore. Uh, East 11th Street in Tulsa was the track there. <coughs> Uh, but again, they are seeing less and less of that. They're seeing more internet and motels, cheap motels. So interesting sort of thing. Oh, here's my favorite. Guys, we're, we're dealing with the same people. 82% are drug dependent. 82% are drug dependent. That's a huge number right there. And 66% admitted to alcohol dependence. And it, in my book, it's, it's the same thing. Right, I'm plus a drug. I don't know why we separate. But interesting sort of things. Pimps and traffickers use a variety of methods. But guys, uh, I'll never forget uh, a statement I heard from a pimp. He said, there are literally uh, manuals on the internet on how to recruit. There are manuals on the internet on how to be a pimp. It's not illegal to write posts. But he told me, he said, you're trying to make too much of this. He said, it's easy. I need two phrases, and any guy can use them. I love you, and you're beautiful. That's it. That's all I need. That's all he needs. Not in this group. Not in this group. This is a little bit different group. I did a group of, uh, I talked to a group of uh, teachers, 120 some odd public school teachers in an auditorium. Guys, I've only been doing this a little while. Law enforcement a long time, but this for a little while. I could almost look across that room and I could pick out five or six pretty easily that if I were gonna target someone, that's who I would target. And, and not so much here, I'll tell you why. Am I going to approach that girl in the mall who's got her head up and her shoulders back and a sense of confidence and a sense of purpose and acts like she's got her stuff together. Am I going to approach that girl who's shuffling along, looks kind of unhappy, has uh, been posting on Facebook for the last six months about how sucky her life is? Why would I want to approach that girl? Is she vulnerable? And that's all it takes. Guys, you can use that at the nightlight. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm not meaning in that way. <laughs> I'm just saying a little I love you every now and then goes a long way. No, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to lie to me because it's, it's, it's depressing. Right? But think about it. We can be outwardly socially acceptable and successful and inwardly socially isolated. And we're raising a generation like that. I'm sorry, young girls, I ain't boys. I see mostly young girls. We're raising a generation like that. They have fewer and fewer face-to-face -face social interactions and a lot more interactions on this or this, or this.
if you're real fancy. You know what I'm saying? So how hard is it for these guys to target these girls? They're using social media, they're identifying vulnerabilities, and then they're gonna pose as a boyfriend. How hard is it? Pip in Chicago was telling us, uh, 14, 15 year old girl, I can't, I can't remember, 14 or 15, let's just say she's 15. He's like 32, 33, 34, something like that. And, and, he, and she's in the mall and she's looking in the window. I did not say you can't take your kids to the mall, please. They are not driving around in vans, hordes of human traffickers, snatching kids from malls. It ain't happening. If it were happening, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you. I'd be out looking for the mall, uh, the vans in the mall. Okay? So, uh, but, he, but he says, what you're looking at is, he says, those tennis shoes, those are neat tennis shoes. And he says, those are $120, because I know what if you go buy the money to buy those. Come on. Takes her in the store, buy a pair of shoes, it ain't nothing. Hey, uh, are you hungry? Let's go to the food court. Yeah, 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 food court. Uh, can I get your phone number? Can I ask you, you know, how, are y'all a couple? Yeah, kind of how you courted your, your wife, girlfriend? Girlfriend, wife? Wife, okay. Uh, I didn't know. So, so kind of how we need courting behavior. We know what courting behavior is, right? We all know what courting. You're actually polite to them. <laughs> so they marry you, and then they shut up. <laughs> One hundred twenty dollars for a And then they're dating. It ain't nothing. They're dating. But she's fifteen. He's thirty-two. Is she gonna tell her mom and dad? <clears throat> Not my house. She ain't. Right? And then what? Then it's really simple after that. Uh, sexual activity becomes photographed sexual activity becomes, oh, I don't know. Uh, gosh, baby, I got into this deal with these guys and I owe them with the money. And if I don't pay them the money by tomorrow, they're going to break my legs. And, but, but that woman thinks you're really cute. And if you would just like go out with him, he, he would forgive that. Or pretty soon it becomes. Uh, would, would you sleep with him? Pretty soon it becomes maybe even a violent gang rape. Pretty soon it becomes all kinds of different things. And there's a point in every girl when they turn that corner. When they realize that sex is a tool and not an intimate act. When they have made sex a weapon a tool, an object to be used, and disconnected it from being an intimate act between two people, they're turned out. It's, they're turned out. That's it. That's where it's at. Right? How many times have you heard we've, we've dealt with drug users for years? I may smoke weed, but I'll never snort coke. I may snort coke, but I'll never use meth. Well, now I'm using meth, but I'll never use a needle. Well, I'll never use, I might be using a needle, but I'll never use somebody else's needle. <laughs> How, it goes right on down that line, guys, and it's that simple. It's that simple. Posing as a boyfriend, using violence, trauma bonding, it's the same psychology as domestic abuse. He beats me, but he loves me. <laughs> he beats me because it's my fault. I shouldn't have done that, right? And the next thing you know, you're hearing ridiculous stuff. I didn't make enough money for him tonight, so he beat me. I knew he would. I knew I had to make some money, but I'm just I mean, I'm like, I'm tired tonight, or whatever. And you hear this crazy justification for the way they're being treated. Because that's how they survive. That's how they survive. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about, talk about uh, gang rape. But it happens. And we talked to the kids today very quickly about if you put it on the internet, it's on there. There's not much we can do about it. If you take those pictures, if they're on there. They're on there. I, I, I told you, did I tell you about the lady at Church of Kennedy or a 13 year old daughter? Right? And she's texting a kid in Minnesota and taking naked pictures. Unfortunately, Mama took all the pictures off the phone because she didn't want me to see them. <laughs> well, I understand that. I didn't want to see him either, but how am I going to make a case? Right? My, my, my whole point is sometimes to protect our kids when we're doing more damage. Right? So, human trafficking. 
exploitation, vulnerable people, forced fraud or coercion, right? For labor or set. And, and I guess we, you know, we can combine those two. But in an Oklahoma, we say uh, labor, uh, adult sex, and domestic minor sex trafficking because minors under 18 are automatically victims, right? So we've talked about the, the, that. We're five minutes late. Are there any questions? I know I went off into a lot of rabbit trails, but I'm trying to share with you everything we've done since last November and the learning curve that we're in as well, right? So if you call me on the phone on a police department says, I got this, is it human trafficking? Uh, maybe. I'm going to send somebody to look at it. And we're going to kind of weigh exploitation, commercial profit, force fraud and coercion, right? Thank you guys. For, you've been really great. You've listened to my stupidity and my rambling. <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm a little twisted. And when I get nervous about something I don't really want to talk to you about because it's not normal for me to stand here and talk to strangers about sex. Is it? <laughs> used to be, but it's not anymore. Uh, <laughs> but my point is that when I get nervous, I make stupid jokes. So are there any questions at all? Anybody got a paper? Do you need something answered? Will you send us the new stats of the, because you had 38, so it's increased or, or, or what? Not? Would you send us the first? I, 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 I'm like, okay. uh, well, my point is this. Uh, <coughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm, Wilma does that. Wilma just does that as a favor. And it's not like I can ask her, hey, send me the stats. I, I, don't, I don't bother her that way because she's got a mission from God that she's doing. And no, seriously, she does. And, and so when she sends them to me, and I, I said, thank, thank, thank you, thank you, and I will send them along. Uh, uh, her, that, that, that's a snapshot in time of what's going on, right? Uh, but, but it's pretty representative of what we're seeing on the street, too. So, any questions? Valerie says it's time to go home. She ran out of tape an hour ago. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming.